Father, we just thank you so much for your faithfulness, Lord, and for your goodness, Father. And I just pray right now that your Holy Spirit would just lead us and guide us as we open up the Word of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, we've been doing a series on deception. The five ways of deception. And this is part four, and the reason is that last time was part three. And this time we're looking at the deception of our memory. The deception of our memory. In Galatians 6, 7, just as a review, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. Do not be deceived. The Bible contains many warnings for believers not to be deceived. The word exepateo in the Greek means to deceive thoroughly or to deceive completely. Exepateo is used only five times in the New Testament. And each usage portrays a different type of deception. To study these five types of deception, it is useful to study them in terms of our five senses and in terms of our triune being, spirit, soul, and body. Just as we have five physical senses to perceive the world around us or to be world conscious, we have five soul senses to enable us to be self-conscious or conscious of the condition of our own souls. We also have five spirit senses to enable us to be God conscious or conscious of God and perceive what he is doing and saying to us. So we have five physical senses for the world around us. We have five soul senses to know the condition of our soul. And we have five spirit senses to be able to perceive God. Previously, we studied the triplet of our spirit, soul, and body senses of hearing, conscience, and faith. And we studied how sin deceives our conscience. We saw that in the natural, by our hearing, we hear the world around us. By our conscience, we speak to our own hearts. Are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the wrong thing? And faith is the way we hear God. We also studied the spirit, soul, body sense triplet of sight, imagination, and hope. And we studied how we deceive our own imagination. And again, with our physical sense of sight, we see the world around us. With our soul sense of imagination, we picture things. And with our spirit sense of hope, we see what God is doing. And last time, we studied the triplet of our spirit, soul, body senses of touch, affection, and love. And how our affections can be deceived. Today, we're going to study the triplet of our spirit, soul, body senses of smell, memory, and the reverential fear of God. Our memory is the most intensely triggered by our physical sense of smell. An adult may not have visited a child home for decades, yet if they smell something associated with that home, for example, their mother's home-baked apple pie, a strong memory of that home will immediately be triggered. In, that, in their memory, it will also be as if they were right back in their home. You ever walk in, you smell something, and it takes you right back to a memory you had maybe decades ago, if you're that old, that is. And so, and just, it, it awakens you, and you remember that memory vividly, but not only you remember it, but you, you sense the emotions of that memory. When one encounters a particular smell, it can immediately transport us back to an earlier time into a pleasant or unpleasant memory associated with that scent. God created the natural world to reveal spiritual truths about the invisible attributes of God, which are clearly seen and can be understood through his creation revealing even his eternal power and Godhead. In other words, God created the natural world to reveal the spiritual truth so we can understand that. Jesus often taught in parables, using examples from the natural world to reveal spiritual truths. The manner in which God created us physically provides with many examples and insights into how God created us spiritually. So God created us physically so we can understand how God created us spiritually. As we study our physical sense of smell, we can derive many insights into our soul sense of memory and our spirit sense of the fear of the Lord. There's a physiological reason for this strong connection between smell and memory. The part of the brain that detects smell, the olfactory bulb, is directly connected to hippocampus, the part of the brain that processes memory, and is also directly connected to the amygdala, the part of the brain that processes emotions. So the way God created our brain is the part that deals with smell, memory, and emotions are directly connected. 
And that's why when we smell something, our memories are immediately triggered. Not only is our physical sense of smell able to trigger memories, it also reactivates the emotions related to those memories. The fear of the Lord creates strong emotions generated from our reborn spirit, which produces both delight and awe at the reality of God. I want to read that again. The fear of the Lord creates strong emotions generated from our reborn spirit, which produces both a delight and an awe at the reality of God. Our physical sense of smell has two main functions which help us to understand the two main purposes for the fear of the Lord. First, our sense of smell enhances our ability to enjoy life. It not only enables us to enjoy all the fragrances that fill the air, but it also plays a vital role in being able to enjoy a meal. Do you know our, our taste buds, there's only five types of taste that we can taste, but smell adds to that. In fact, if you have a, a bad cold and you can't smell, food tastes much blander. It tastes different and it tastes blander. So smell enables us to enjoy a meal. It enables us to enjoy the surroundings when you smell the flowers, when you smell after a rain. In other words, it, there's a huge uh, uh, area that we're enjoying of life through smell. We're not maybe conscious of it. We don't think about it, but it's there. And if we lose our smell, you'll see a great loss. Isaiah 11.3 says this, Isaiah 11.3. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. This scripture speaks prophetically about Jesus and clearly states that he has the fear of the Lord. Jesus, the Son of God, has the fear of the Lord. If Jesus had the, has the fear of the Lord, and he is the Son of God, how much more do we need the fear of the Lord? Another important thing we can learn about the fear of the Lord from Isaiah 11.3 is his delight is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord brings a delight to our souls and enables us to enjoy life to the fullest. Just as our sense of smell enables us to enjoy things around us, our food and, and all those fragrances around us, the fear of the Lord enables us to enjoy God. It enables us to enjoy our fellowship with God. And without the fear of the Lord, it's like losing your sense of smell and not being able to enjoy the things around us the way we should. Christians who don't have the fear of the Lord are generally dissatisfied with their relationship with God. They look for other activities or possessions to fill the void, and some of those counterfeits can be very destructive to their lives. In other words, if you don't have the fear of the Lord, you, it's not enjoyable, it's not wonderful to seek God, to fellowship with God. You realize that? If you don't have the fear of the Lord, it's like, oh, I'll come to church, yeah, okay. You know, because the fear of the Lord enables us to experience God. Without the fear of the Lord, we will live lukewarm lives at best, or lives filled with dissipation and immorality at worst. When Christians seek to please the flesh, it is because they're either bored or trying to flee from painful circumstances in their life. The answer to their struggle against temptation is the fear of the Lord because it produces a deep delight and satisfaction in our hearts. It fills the void so we, can, we no longer need or want to walk in sin. And as the fear of the Lord makes our relation with God enjoyable, it's a delight then. His delight is the fear of the Lord. The Hebrew word that is translated delight literally means to use the perceptible sense of the nose to distinguish odors or aromas and to respond appropriately. In other words, it means to smell. So the Hebrew word there, delight, actually means to smell. To be able to smell. Isn't that interesting? If we recognize the reality that the, spirit, that the fear of the Lord is our spirit sense of being able to smell God, to experience God. It's interesting, it says that in, in, in Isaiah 11, 3, his delight or his ability to smell the presence of God, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. We could say this, Jesus wasn't guided by what he saw, or about what he heard, but by the fragrance of God. Jesus was 
motivated and led, not by what he saw in the natural, not by what he heard, but by the fragrance of God. That's a Howard translation. Anyways, <laughs> the fear... <laughs> The fear of the Lord brings delight because it enables us to experience God and the sweet aroma of his presence that delights our hearts. In other words, if you don't have the fear of the Lord, it's like walking into a kitchen that somebody's baking a wonderful meal, but you can't smell it. So you go in and, and if you can't smell it, you say, oh, yeah. But somebody else who can smell it goes, wow, I'm so hungry. What's the difference? One person can't smell the aroma of the cooking and the other person can. That's why when we have prayer meetings, people who can sense God's presence, they come to the prayer meeting and want to pray for an hour or two hours. Why? Because they're coming there and they're experiencing the aroma of God's presence. But someone who doesn't says, well, when's this over with? The, the Hebrew word that is translated delight also means to come close. In other words, to come very near to an object so as to virtually meet it as a figurative extension of placing the nose close to an object to smell it. That's why it means that word can be translated coming close because when you want to smell something, you come really close. Like when I shaved last night, I said, you want to smell my aftershave? So my wife comes real close and smells it and says, that smells good. And so that's... But you, she bought the aftershave, that's why it smells good. But anyways, <laughs> but, but anyways, but the, but the point is that, so the word delight means also to draw close so you can smell the fragrance of something or someone. So the fear of the Lord speaks about having an intimate and close relationship with God. We delight to do what pleases God's heart because we're drawn close to him and we're experiencing God. So you're getting a picture of what the fear of the Lord, the Bible teaches. Just as the physical sense of smell enables us to enjoy and experience the physical world in a way that brings us delight, the fear of the Lord enables us to enjoy and experience the delight of the closeness of God's presence. You know, in our church, God is moving amongst the youth in our church. I am so thankful to the Lord what God is doing. And you know, Wednesdays, they have a prayer meeting, prayer worship time, and they start about 7 o'clock at night. Sometimes they go to 11 or 11.30 in prayer and worship. What would teenagers want to be three or four hours just praying and worshiping God? Because they have become accustomed to the fragrance of God's presence. Amen. Isn't that exciting? Amen. Our physical sense of smell not only enhances our ability to enjoy life, it also provides a second and equally important function, that of warning us of something that is either dangerous or unhealthy. In other words, the sense of smell not only provides something pleasant, but it also warns us when there's something that's dangerous or unhealthy. Proverbs 16.6, 6, in mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. Our sense of smell alerts us when food has spoiled and the smell of smoke warns us when there is a fire. Similarly, the fear of the Lord alerts us when something is evil or dangerous, providing protection for us if we, need God's, if we heed God's warning. It says the fear of the Lord, and by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. The Hebrew word that is translated departs means to change direction to leave off, to turn away, to avoid. When we smell rotting food or excrement, we are instinctively repulsed. When we have the fear of the Lord, we immediately recognize when something is evil or defiling, and we turn away in disgust. And you know, the fragrant, our smell provides strong emotions. If you walk in a room and you smell baked goods, the emotion of, wow, I'm hungry. But when you smell something that's, that's gross, you're, oh! Right? It's a strong emotion. And it, it provides us with protection. You don't have to teach a child, this smells bad and that smells good. They know. It's hardwired into them by God. You know, it's like, it's, it provides protection. Like, for instance, in our, our fridge sometimes, we have things that are a little bit older. I don't know if you ever have that in your fridge, but we have that sometimes in our fridge. And so I don't look at months, I look at years. Right? What year is that? But anyways... But, but when, we're, when, when it's questionable, 
My, I say to my wife, can I eat this? She will take it. And what does she do? She takes it and puts her nose to it. And she either judges it and declares it safe or this will kill you if you die, if you eat this, right? In other words, her nose knows, right? So it allows us to know what is good and what is bad, what will harm us and what will benefit us. I know, I'll clean up the fridge. So anyways, <laughs> Proverbs 8.13. Proverbs 8.13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and evil way, and the perverse mouth I hate. Just as a foul smell immediately produces a strong negative emotional response. The fear of the Lord will also cause us to hate evil and will enable us, uh, will be, will be uh, unable to tolerate the stench of sin. In other words, when we have the fear of the Lord, we'll immediately sense evil, sense sin, and we'll, wow, I'm repulsed by that. Amen. See the advantage of the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord enables us to detect the foul smell of pride and arrogance and the disgusting odor of perverse words. But I'm not talking about the arrogance or the pride or the foul words of others. I'm speaking about our own body odor from our fleshly ways of acting and thinking. God hasn't called us to judge others, but to judge yourselves and immediately recognize when we need a spiritual bath or a spiritual shot of mouthwash. <laughs> right? In other words, the fear of the Lord isn't saying, look at what that other person is doing. That's not the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to detect when we have a bad odor spiritually because of our attitudes, because of things we've said. That's the fear of the Lord. It doesn't take a spiritual person to point out failures of other people. But it takes a spiritual person to recognize our own. Nobody said amen. But anyways, we're going on. We're going on. <laughs> the sinful human condition causes us to see others' faults, but blinds us to the same faults hidden in our own heart. Jesus gave us a word picture seeing the speck in another's eye while ignoring the log in your own. You know, it's sort of like, we always can see someone else's faults, but we don't recognize our own. For instance, you ever had somebody come to you and say, I can't stand that person, they're always gossiping. Well, you know what they're doing, they're gossiping about the gossip. <laughs> or somebody says, you know, that person's so judgmental, you know something, they're judging that other person. That person's so touchy, well, they're really the one that's touchy because they're offended by that person. Or that person is so selfish, they always want their way, so I can't always have my way. So you see what happens is we see the failure in others, but we are blind to our own sins. But God wants us to have the fear of the Lord so we can detect when we have that bad body odor or need that spiritual mouthwash. The fear of the Lord enables us to focus on the reality of Jesus. And as we do, we become aware of the log in our own eye and see our need to repent. In other words, as we take our eyes off of others, the fear of the Lord makes us more conscious of God. And as we do, he shows those things we need to deal with. We don't have to look at ourselves and look at others. We look to him. And as we do, we become conscious of what God wants to show us, what the Holy Spirit wants to show us. When we lack the fear of the Lord, we are judgmental and critical of others. When we have the fear of the Lord, we are merciful and patient with the failures and weaknesses of others. In other words, when we have the fear of the Lord, when we see somebody fail or somebody offends us, we don't react to that. We are patient. We are merciful to them. The fear of the Lord awakens us to the ever-present reality of God in our lives. As a result, we seek to please Him, not out of dread, but out of love. The problem is, many believers aren't aware that they're not really focusing on the Lord. And when we're not focusing on the Lord, we are carnal. When the Holy Spirit reveals to us an area of unconfessed sin, the fear of the Lord causes us to repent. Our desire is always to experience the fragrant aroma of the, Spirit of, the presence of God. And for our lives to be an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And others, when we have the fear of the Lord, our desire is to rejoice God's heart. That's the fear of the Lord. Is God, we want to be a pleasant aroma, not a foul stench. 
When our lives are defiled by sin, God still loves us as his children, but the stench of our sinful actions grieve his heart just as a loving parent is grieved when he or she sees their child making destructive choices. Now, what the fear of the Lord is not. What the fear of the Lord is not. James 2, verses 19 and 20. James 2, verses 19 and 20. You believe there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe, and they tremble. But do you want to know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? The Greek word for tremble is frizo, and it means to be extremely afraid, to shiver with fear, signifying terror. Do demons have the fear of the Lord? Demons do not have the fear of the Lord, but they do experience the terror of God. Demons do not experience any delight when they are confronted by the presence of God. Only an overwhelming terror. The fear of God is not, oh, God is here. I'm so fearful. That's not the fear. Of the, that's the terror of God. Demons do not have the fear of the Lord because they have no delight in God's presence, but they have the terror of God when God's presence shows up. If we have the fear of the Lord, we will love God so much that our greatest desire will be to do his will. In other words, it will cause us to do good works. Faith through the works is dead. When we have the fear of the Lord, we're not going to flee from God. We're going to try to get closer. They smell more of that fragrance of the Lord, right? And as we do, we're going to want to do things that will bring joy to his heart and remove those things that hinder us from being close to God. I'm going to write that down. I like that. God wants believers to have the fear of the Lord, but he doesn't want us to be afraid of him. I'm going to read that again. God wants believers to have the fear of the Lord, but he does not want us to be afraid of him. Because when we're afraid of God, we withdraw from God. When we have the fear of God, we draw closer to God. If we are afraid of God, there is something wrong with our perception of God, and by extension, our relationship with God. In other words, we have the wrong perception of God. Either we have failed to perceive God's love or there are things in our lives we refuse to relinquish which hinder our relationship with God. In other words, you have a backslidden Christian. The last place a backslidden Christian wants to be is in church. Right? They don't want to be in church because they feel condemnation. It's not God condemning them. It's because they have a wrong perception of God and there's things in their lives they don't want to let go of and they don't want to go to church. That's not the fear of the Lord. That's, they're afraid of God because they don't have the right perception of God and there are things in their lives that they're not wanting to let go. Revelation 6, verses 14 to 16. Revelation chapter 6, verses 14 to 16. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And to the mountains and rocks, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation 6, 14. 14 to 16, describes what unbelievers will experience when Christ returns and how they will react to his presence. This is not the fear of the Lord, but the terror a rebellious sinner experiences when confronted by the holiness of God and his ensuing judgment. So in the world, when Christ comes to judge the world, those who rejected him, they're not going to say, oh, how wonderful. They're going to be filled with terror and say, let the mountains fall and crush us better than to be able to be experiencing the presence of God. It's so terrifying for them. Now compare the response to a believer, uh, to believers, uh, to Christ's appearing to that of unbelievers. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10 describes how believers respond to the presence of God or to the return of Christ. 
For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. It says, and to wait for his Son from heaven. The Greek word for wait is, means to wait with expectation. The Greek word means actually to wait with expectation. It signifies the anticipation and excitement of those who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. In other words, the people who are, were saved, we're looking forward for Jesus to return. We're looking forward to that day that we meet him face to face. And then it says, who delivers us from the wrath to come. What takes the terror of God and transforms it into the fear of the Lord? It is knowing that we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and that he loves us and he's delivered us from the wrath to come. See, the terror of God is the unbelievers and the demons, they're fearful and they're filled with terror because they know there's judgment and wrath coming. But for us, he has delivered us and redeemed us so we're not under wrath but salvation, redemption. Psalm 130, verse 4. Psalm 130, verse 4. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. The fear of the Lord is founded on the very fact that forgiveness has been extended to us. Do you see that? In other words, there is forgiveness with God, so he may be feared. In other words, if there is no forgiveness, there is no fear of the Lord. There's terror, but there's no fear of the Lord, because there's hopelessness. The difference between the fear of the Lord and the terror of God is that the first elicits hope, and the second, hopelessness. The fear of the Lord is filled with hope, but the terror of God is filled with hopelessness, knowing there's no forgiveness. But as long as we're alive on this earth, people can come to find Christ and have their sins removed and their terror of God will be re replaced with the delight of knowing that there's hope, that there's salvation now. The fear of the Lord is based on love. God's love for us and our love for him. The fear of the Lord can only be correctly understood in the context of love. When we really love God, we will not want to cause him sorrow or bring shame to his name. The single motivation, that single motivation will encourage us to live a holy life. You know, people have a hard time sometimes understanding the fear of the Lord. They have a hard time understanding it. And the reason is, they are trying to understand the fear of the Lord from the point of view of fear. Where we really need to understand the fear of the Lord from the context of love. So that's why people are saying, oh, the fear of God. And, and they're, what they're doing is they're not bringing from the context of love, but of terror. God does chasten his children when they are rebellious, but his chastening is born out of his love for us. He desires to see us live fruitful and productive lives, free from the destructive effects of sin. Some believers are motivated out of fear of being chastened. This motivation re reflects a very immature level of spiritual growth, like a young child who's still self-willed. In other words, when you have a young child, sometimes they just don't listen. Well, we're going to take out the wood spoon. Today, we're going to take out the wood spoon. And the parent's doing that because the child's yet, not yet motivated by love. So we just provide a little bit of motivation. <laughs> but the thing is, but as we grow and mature... It says in 1 John 4.18, 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. See, a mature son and daughter obeys their parents not out of the fear that they're going to be chastened, but because they love their parents and want to bless them. You know, one idea of the fear of the Lord is that if you really love someone, you wouldn't want to do anything that would hurt them. And that is the fear of the Lord. That God, I don't want to do anything that would grieve your heart. Uh, the fear of the Lord is vital. And without it, we will live defeated and unfruitful lives. Without the fear of the Lord, we will serve God only at our convenience. And compromise will permeate our lives. In other words, the fear of the Lord is so essential for each one of us. You know, some people are in ministry, but they don't have the fear of the Lord. 
And yet the result is they have hidden sins. And eventually those hidden sins come forward and their ministry and life collapses and it brings shame to the gospel. It's because they don't have the fear of the Lord. They weren't ministering because they desired to fulfill God's will and to bless people with the gospel of Jesus. They were ministering out of a need to be seen. So it wasn't really the fear of the Lord. But when we have the fear of the Lord, the first thing we want to do is, Lord, I want to keep my heart clean. I don't want to have anything hidden. So show me. If there's something, Lord, that's in my life, just show me. And I just want to repent of it. I just want to confess it. I don't want to leave it and let it fester and end up destroying my ministry and my life and bringing shame to your name. The gospel has been hurt so much by people who've tried to serve God, but without the fear of the Lord. And because of that, hidden sins festered till their lives and ministries collapsed. Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Three words that run through the book of Proverbs are knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Knowledge is having information or truth about something or someone. We can receive knowledge about God by reading the Bible, listening to sermons, or having discussions with fellow believers. Understanding is being able to grasp the significance of the knowledge one has received or possesses. Understanding takes the knowledge of God to a deeper level. We receive understanding by meditating and prayerfully seeking God about the things we already know about Him. And understanding is like taking what we know and starting to really grasp it, to really understand it, to really say yes. But wisdom is the insight in how to apply the things we have learned and the motivation to actually do them. Wisdom is the application of those things we understand so our lives are actually transformed and become fruitful. Wisdom is where we begin to walk the talk. So wisdom is not only knowledge, knowing it, understanding, really being able to grasp the significance, but wisdom is actually doing it. You ever met a person who has all the answers but never improves his own life? Right? They always have a, yeah, you do this, you should do that, you should do this. That guy is a wise guy but not a wise person. That's a joke. But anyways... <laughs> The thing is, because a person who's wise, if you see someone who knows what to do is right and is not doing it, that person's a fool. Right? In other words, wisdom is knowing what to do and then actually doing it. The fear of the Lord makes God so real to us that it changes the way we think and speak and act. That's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord enables us and empowers us to actually apply the things he's showing us. It's really interesting. Last night, at the same time, the fire department came by too. I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> the fear of the Lord empowers us to take the things we know and have learned and begin to live them. It, begin, it gives us the ability, the power to actually apply those things to our lives. That's wisdom. Most Christians know we need to devote time to prayer and Bible study, but few actually do it. Right? Everybody says, well, should we spend more time in prayer in the Word? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But do you, well, how many do it? Wisdom, the fear of the Lord gives us the ability to want to do it, to want to spend time in God's presence, to put our priority so God is first. That's wisdom. The fear of the Lord brings the reality of God into our lives, so we want to pray and study His Word. Not because we're afraid of Him, but because He is so awesome we can't get enough of Him. It's like we walk into that room and the fragrance of beautiful cooked food, right? And we say, yes, I'm ready to eat. And we come and start to say, God, I want to spend time in prayer. And our hearts are saying, yes, Lord, I want to experience your presence. Psalm 111, verse 10. Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom because it motivates us to obey God's commandments and to keep his word. Isaiah 11, uh, sorry, Isaiah 33, 6. Isaiah 33, verse 6. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of our times and the strength of salvation. And the fear of the Lord is his treasure. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. The Hebrew word for treasure means 
treasure storehouse or treasury and can be translated as the fear of the Lord is a treasury. What's a treasury? It's a place that you put treasures in for safekeeping. Salvation is much more than escaping hell and getting to heaven. It includes inheriting all the promises of God and living an abundant life. Many Christians do not know how to guard the treasures that God has given them through his word and the many wonderful experiences they've received. In other words, God does things in our lives, but, but we seem to lose them. But the fear of the Lord will enable us to keep them in a safe place where they stay, they're, they're safe, that we don't lose them. The fear of the Lord is described as a storehouse or treasury where we can safely store all the treasures God has given us. The enemy can't steal them and we won't lose them out of neglect. Some things the enemy steals when we're not watching and some things we lose because we neglect them. But the fear of the Lord enables us to be able to take all those wonderful things God has given us and to retain them and keep adding more and more to it. How does the fear of the Lord relate to memory? How does the fear of the Lord relate to memory? The fear of the Lord is being conscious of the reality of God. When we remember all that God has done for us and all his mighty deeds, we are filled with awe. The fear of the Lord is being conscious of the reality of God. When we remember all that God has done for us and all his mighty deeds, we are filled with awe. Psalm 77, verses 11 to 14. Psalm 77, verses 11 to 14. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will also meditate on your work and talk of your deeds. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God is our God. You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. The reality of God fills our heart as we remember his mighty works, meditate on all that he has done, and speak about his deeds and how wonderful he is. That's how memory works. When we start to remember, wow, I remember you did that, Lord. And we start to remember and meditate on those things and then share them with others. Believers who constantly speak about God, spend time in prayer, read the Bible, are filled with awe, and the fear of the Lord is their delight. Because God's real. If you, you see a Christian who's always talking about God and praying and, and sharing the gospel and just talking and, and worshiping God throughout the day, I mean, they're so filled with the presence of God. God is so wonderful. The fourth time that the Greek word exepateo, meaning to deceive thoroughly or completely, is found in the New Testament is in relationship to our, in relationship to our soul sense of memory, and it is in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. So I'd like to read 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 5. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was with you still, I told you these things? Paul warns the church of Thessalonica, let no one deceive you, thoroughly deceive you, by any means. He told them how to be protected from the type of deception which they were being confronted with. Do you not remember the things I taught you? This type of deception attacks our ability to remember the things we have already learned or experienced with God. The result of being deceived near your memory is that it produces fear and causes to be shaken in mind and troubled. In other words, they were deceived in their area of memory and the result was fear and terror. Isn't that interesting? To be shaken in mind, to be agitated. The remarkable thing, this is what Oswald Chambers says. I love this quote. The remarkable thing about fearing God is when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas, if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. I'm going to read that again. The remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas, if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Proverbs 14.26 says this. Proverbs 14.26 
In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. One of the wonderful things about the fear of the Lord is, is that it actually delivers and frees us from fear because it provides us with a strong confidence in God. Isn't that a strange? If you have the fear of the Lord, you'll be free from fear. You get it now, right? If I said at the beginning of the sermon, you'd say, this guy's wacko, right? But you, you see it now, right? The fear of the Lord sets us free from fear. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is being so conscious of God and the reality of God that we're not afraid of anything else. Amen. Christians who do not have the fear of the Lord often struggle with worries and the uncertainties of this life. I like what Corey Ten Boom said. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. This life is filled with unknowns. We don't know what tomorrow will hold. But we know who holds tomorrow. We know that the Lord is faithful. And we can trust God. And that will bring peace. But the fear of the Lord gives us the confidence of the reality of God in our lives. Remembering God's faithfulness provides us with a peace that passes all understanding. As we said it previously, sin deceives our conscience, and we deceive our own imagination, and Satan deceives our affections. Our memories are deceived by fictitious reports or information. Paul warns them not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, but instead to remember what he had taught them. Fictitious reports can take on the form of spirit, word, logos, or letter, epistle. We are not to be shaken by false spirits, false prophecies, or false revelations that people fabricate. So sometimes someone will say, well, God told me this or that, but, but, but is it scriptural? In other words, if it's not according to scripture, don't worry about it, toss it aside. We are not to be shaken by false words. False teachings that are contrary to sound doctrine. Sometimes people have this doctrine and that doctrine, say, but, but is that scriptural? Don't allow that to bring confusion to us. Are we shaken by false letters, false reports and rumors and all sorts of news? In other words, you know, this, the, I think we're living in the age of all mankind, the age where information and news is everywhere. Right? You, you turn on your computer, you have your tablet, you listen to the radio. I mean, everywhere. It's just information, 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 information. And what happens is we forget the truth. We forget the truth. Not only can false revelations, false teachings, and rumors, and news bring confusion to the truth, they produce distractions that hinder us from focusing on the wonder of God. You know, some people are so busy reading about what's going on in the world, they forget about the wonder of God, so they're not excited about God. They just want to know what Putin's doing next. <laughs> Whatever he's doing, I don't know. But anyways, <laughs> some Christians get so caught up in studying about end-time events that their relationship with God gets sidelined. You go, well, how's that? It says that we should look forward to the return of Christ. Yes, and we look forward to the return of Christ. Our focus is Jesus. But when we're so focused on the end times, what's going on here, what's going on there, what's happening here, you know something? Our focus is not on God, and it brings forth an unsettling in our hearts. What kind of conspiracy is happening next? Well, I don't know. But there's lots of conspiracies, but I don't know, and I don't care. I'm not interested in what Satan's doing. I'm interested in what God is doing. Yeah. Right? And so the thing is that when we focus on those things, what do we do? We forget what God is doing. The best way to get someone to forget something is to re redirect his or her mind to something else. Isn't that true? The best way to get someone to forget something is to redirect his or her mind to something else. When we get distracted, we forget the important things. When we get distracted, we forget the important things. And so many believers are distracted. They forget the important things. And that's why they're not excited about God anymore. Because he's the most important. You know, I give an example of getting distracted. When, when I... When we had our children were really small, now they're 30 and stuff, but anyway, they're really small, and my wife went shopping, and, and of course she likes to shop in clothing stores and stuff, and, and that doesn't really do much for me, but I, I went into the mall, and I went to the hardware store, right, because men like to look at tools, because tools are much more exciting than dresses, and so, <laughs> amen, right, so anyways, <laughs> and so I remember my boys were like three and four, or whatever, and and I'm there, and I'm looking at tools, and I got so focused on the tools, I forgot something. For a few minutes, I forgot I had children. <laughs> right? Then all of a sudden, I go, 
I've got children. And I go, no, I don't. <laughs> and I was fearful. I go, what happened to my children, right? And I'm running around there just in another aisle down. <laughs> I never did tell Lena that one. <laughs> Forgive me now. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to go on. <laughs> but the thing is, so when we get distracted, we forget about the most important things. The things of God. When we're so interested in what's going on around us, but we're not excited about God, that means we have forgotten and we've been distracted. Our memories have become deceived. Our memories have become deceived. And the things that we should remember, we're not remembering. There is one more unique characteristic about the physical sense of smell that gives us spiritual insights into how our memories can be deceived. Smell is, not only the, is, smell is the only physical sense that can come quickly become desensitized to its environment. Do you realize that? The sense of smell grows accustomed, the sense of smell grows accustomed to a certain odor or scent and no longer detects it such as the fragrance or perfume one is wearing or the scent of one owns house. You know what I mean? It's not true. You put on some cologne or something. You put it on and a few seconds later you can't smell it anymore. And no matter how hard you try, you can't smell it. In other words, it just goes. Do you ever notice that everybody house, sm house f smells funny except your own? <laughs> your house doesn't have any smell at all, but everybody else has a funny smell, right? <laughs> you ever notice that? <laughs> That's because your nose becomes desensitized to that smell. But hearing is different. Like, for instance, you can be in a room and there's a clock ticking. Tick, 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 tick. And after a while, you can block that out. You don't notice it. But as soon as you want to, you can hear the ticking again, can't you? But with smell, you can't do that. No matter how hard you try, you can't smell how your house smells. The only way you'll know if your house stinks really bad is you leave for two weeks and you come back. <laughs> We're going to leave that comment alone, too. So... One air freshener manufacturer coined the term nose blindness, referring to the physiological phenomena. Nose blindness. Memory can be deceived in a similar fashion when we remember a certain experience, but it no longer has any impact on us. For those who have come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior, there are times when we've experienced the joy and the wonder of God. The times when God supernaturally and instantaneously healed people. The times when God answered prayer in amazing and totally unexpected ways. The times when we were in such difficult and, and seemingly impossible situations and God transformed our circumstances into a blessing. In each one of those times when God intervened or invaded our lives in a very tangible way, we were filled with such joy and peace and love, we felt we'd always be thankful and joyful. However, the impact of those memories faded as we succumbed to nose blindness. We lost the wonderful fragrance of those experiences and memories. You know, those who know the Lord have all had experiences with God. People have been healed, God answering prayers. I was talking to Pearl this morning. I remember about, it was about eight years ago. Um, in my office, Pearl, we were working together, and, and one fellow came in, Russ, and he had broken his hip. He was a Christian. He can't come to the church. He had broken his hip, and it put it together, but it didn't heal properly, and he couldn't put any weight on it, so he was on crutches. He couldn't put any weight. It was not only a lot of pain, but it no, had no strength. So he came in, and, and Pearl, you were there, and we just prayed for him for about two minutes, and all of a sudden he goes, the pain's gone, and then he did something remarkable. He stood on his bad leg and he did squats. He just did squats. Remember that? He walked in five minutes before. He could not put weight on that leg. We prayed for him. Two minutes later, God supernaturally healed him that not only the pain was gone, but he could squat his whole weight on the one leg that he couldn't even stand on five minutes before. Remember that, Pearl? Isn't that amazing? But why I'm saying that, why I'm saying that is if we bring that memory alive again, it will fill us with confidence and joy. How many things has God done in your life, but you have allowed nose blindness to cause you to be desensitized to that memory? And we need to resensitize ourselves to the marvelous things God has done. I could go on and on and on with the way I've seen God move miraculously in people's lives, in the church, not only our church, in other churches too. Where I, there's situations like, God, how, 
can I ever, can you ever resolve this? And God resolved it. And so what it did is, as we begin to ponder those things he's done, we again wake in those memories because they faded, the impact. That's why we're not joyful and thankful then. But as I spend time in the word and prayer, every day one of the things I do when I begin to pray is I begin to give thanks for those things. And as I do, I awaken those memories and the strong emotions of peace and joy and thankfulness that is produced by those memories. No matter how much God does for us, no matter how many miracles we experience or people he heals, we will never benefit from the long-lasting impact of those memories until we learn how to keep those memories fresh within our hearts. God has done so many amazing things. I love sharing what God has done with other people. You know why? Because when I do, it awakens those memories to me. Wow, that was amazing. Amazing what God does. And I go, I mean, not what I've read in a book. Not what somebody's told me 100 miles away. What God has done in my life and in your lives and in our, in our surroundings. Isn't that amazing? And so we need to learn how to keep those memories alive. You know, when a, you know sometimes you have a Christian struggling. Oh, and they say, life's really tough. And I say, well, let's just pray. Well, I'm just kind of down. And let's just pray. Let's start worshiping God. So we start worshiping God. After about 10 minutes, they say, I feel so much better. I said, I didn't know why I didn't do this three days ago. Right? Because they forgot the experience of enjoying God's presence. The memory of those experiences. Or I remember Jamie Sue, right? It was about a year and a half ago. She came in. When she first came to the church, it's okay if I point you out. Well, it's too late now anyways. So, um, <laughs> so but I remember when she first came in, she kind of, she, she looked at me like, we were jaded. Yeah, I was crazy. I, I didn't want to say that way, but yeah, that was true. You looked at me like we were crazy. But I remember that one, you're coming for about a month, and that one Sunday, when the presence of God came over you, and you got filled with the Holy Spirit, and you began to speak in tongues, right? And she went from being like one person to another person in one second of time, in one second of time. And I remember that, I go, wow, God, you are so amazing. You are so amazing. Well, we think about that. Every time you're down, you think about that. You go, wow, it will awaken those memories, that fragrance of God's presence in your life. See, that one memory alone would be enough for your whole life. But he's done so many things and so many more he wants to. But if, if no matter how many times God answered our prayers, but if we don't learn to awaken those memories and keep them fresh, it'll never be enough. But if he never did another thing again, and he wants to do many things, but if he never did another thing again, we have enough experiences with God to stir our hearts with all those memories that we could be filled with joy and thanksgiving and peace. But he wants to do more. Also with memory, that just as we become desensitized to good smells, we can be desensitized to bad smells. Sometimes I deal with people that when they have struggles with addictions or different things, we all have struggles in. And then they go back to that behavior. And then later on they go, oh, why did I do that? But at the time when they're being tempted, they forgot the memory of what it was like that after they did it, how, how much it hurt them and how bad it was. But we need to awaken our memories so we don't do those things. Oh, I don't want to do that because when I did it, I felt so lousy. And it caused so much pain and harm. In other words, we need to awaken those memories of the things that were wrong so we'll say, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore because that was destructive. That was painful. So we want to remember the good things to stir us, but we also want to remember, don't do that anymore because that hurt last time. Often people have a supernatural encounter with God that was truly amazing, but then the impact of that encounter fades as they fail to cultivate their experience with thanksgiving, praise, and obedience. The supernatural experience does not mean they've arrived at a vibrant relationship with God. It is an invitation for them to respond to God so they can develop a more vibrant relationship with him. That's what it is. When, we, when you have a supernatural, we had another brother, Jordan, right? On Wednesday, we prayed together. And the presence of God came out. You started speaking in tongues. I mean, this guy never even knew what it was. He walked in. I thought, this guy could hardly walk when he left that prayer meeting. Isn't that true? He didn't know what was going on. How are you excited about God, aren't you, right? It's overwhelming. It is so wonderful. God is so wonderful. 
That God is so wonderful. But the thing is that we need to learn how to keep those experience is vibrant. The, the experience is not saying you have arrived. The experience is an invitation for you to take that experience and use that experience to be excited about God, to grow in him. That's what it is. It's an invitation. Many people think, well, I've arrived now because I had a big vision or I had this experience. No, no, it's an invitation. Now go on. Now move forward. You know, 22 years, I've been a believer 38 years, but 22 years ago, I had a special encounter with God. And he filled me with the Holy Spirit. It was just a really amazing encounter. I don't have a lot of encounters like that. Just, but you know something? I had a decision to make. I could have said, well, that was really neat and, and let it fade. Because a lot of times people have real experience with God, exciting, but then they just kind of go on and the, the memory of that fades. And they fall back into their old routine. But I made a decision and it was by the grace of God. It's God, I'm going to pursue you. This is so exciting. I'm going to pursue you. That was 22 years ago. And I thought, I'm going to see what God is going to do. I'm going to pursue him. And that's 22 years ago. And that's what God wants to do in every one of your lives. You've had experience with God. If you're born again, you've had experience with God. Start to say, God, remi remind me of those experiences. Remind me of the joy and excitement of the experiences. And I want to stir those experiences. I want to stir that memory again. You know what I do every morning when I get up? When I pray, the first thing I do, I like to spend time giving thanks to God. You know, it's like, that's dessert. And I like dessert before the main meal. So what I like to do is I want to spend time thanking God. So what I do is I begin to worship God. And when I do, I get excited about being saved again. I get excited about being saved. I get excited about what God has done in my life and my wife and my children, what he's done in the church, what he's done in uh, so many ways. And so I begin to give thanks to him. I give thanks that he didn't allow me to stay as a lukewarm Christian. Because for the first 17 years, I was a lukewarm Christian. I went to church every two, three times a week. But I was lukewarm. I was lukewarm. I know that's not great qualifications of being a pastor, but that's what I was. But when I had that experience, I made a decision. And so every morning I get up and I just start to worship God. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for revealing your son to me 38 years ago. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving me eternal life. That I am not fearful of the future. I'm not fearful of dying. I'm not fearful of this life. I am fearful of you only because I'm joyful in you. That you are so wonderful. You are so glorious. Thank you for not allowing my life to be wasted. But thank you, Lord, that you're using my life to be fruit to other people for your glory. Thank you that my my life has purpose beyond just doing something for myself. And so I do that every day and I'm thanking him. And when I do, then my memories stir up and I'm excited again. Instead of saying, well, God, what are you going to do today for me? <laughs> because no matter what you, he does, if you don't learn to keep those memories alive, every memory of what he does will fade. But if you stir it up, you will be so overwhelmed with so many things you've got to be thankful of and joyful for. You won't have time every day to thank him for all those things. You'll have to rotate them. <laughs> if a person has an, has an encounter with God, but they fail to act on that experience with God, they soon, then soon the impact of that encounter will fade and the window of opportunity will close. God doesn't close the window of opportunity. They close it by neglecting to pursue God and the memory of that experience fades. You see that? It's like when God does something, it's an invitation for you now to respond. But if you don't, that window of opportunity closes because the impact of that memory fades on you. However, if we choose to experience God, however, when we experience God, we use that experience as a springboard to pursue him in a greater way, then that memory and its impact will stay fresh within our hearts and minds. As we remember what God has done, our hearts will continue to be filled with the reality of God, and that really defines the fear of the Lord. In other words, take every one of those experiences you've had and start to stir them up. And when you get a new experience stirred up, you know what I do? You know I do this, is I, I write down every time there's a prophetic word that God has given me, every time God does a miracle, whatever, I write these things down. I got like 300 typewritten pages now. And I, I've got them dated and everything else. And I go, Lord said this, and then so many years later, he did that, or so many weeks later, or so many days later. And I go, wow, this is so mind-blowing. This is so, people say, how do you believe in God? I say, how do you not? <laughs> Amen. 
Lukewarmness or losing our first love is a sign that our memories have been deceived by distraction, false reports, or worldly pursuits. And the initial excitement of encountering God has faded. We have left our vibrant relationship with God to simply go through the motions of being religious. In other words, if you're not excited about God, that means your memories have been deceived. That's not a, nobody says amen again, so I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> but the thing is, but God wants us to realize that we need to revive those memories. And as we do, that excitement, so we want to be with, with, with others to, to fellowship. We want to share what Jesus is doing. We want to pray. We want to read the word. We want to seek God because, wow, God is exciting. God is more wonderful than anything else. He is so real. That's what stirs us. So if we're feeling, well, I'm just going on day by day, we need to say, God, help me, Lord, to remind me of those wonderful things you've done and help me learn how to stir those memories up to be filled with that joy again. Amen. So that, that lukewarmness will be gone and we'll return to our first love. I remember when I first got saved, that was 38 years ago, I was so excited, I just couldn't stop smiling. Wow, I'm being Jewish, I didn't even know you could be saved, right? I mean, we didn't even talk about that. And to find out that I, I was saved now, wow, that I have eternal life, that God was my father, that my sins were gone, that I was given the righteousness of Christ. I go, wow, and I had a purpose. Now that I've grown a little bit older, right, and I, and I think, you know, I don't regret my life. But I think, what would my life have been like if I hadn't received Christ? I'd be facing getting old and just life winding down pretty sad. But with the Lord, life's winding up. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Our last scripture, Malachi 3, verses 16 and 17. Malachi 3, verses 16 and 17. Then those who feared the Lord spoke, one, spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels. I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard him, heard them. This is a beautiful picture of fellowship in the fear of the Lord. It is so sweet that the Lord delights to listen and hear our conversations and notes what we are saying. Isn't that great? We get together and we're sharing about the things of God, and guess what? God is listening. God is listening and he's taking note of that. Isn't that a wonderful way to keep those memories alive by sharing it? That not only are we sharing, but God's listening in. When the fear of the Lord is a reality, fellowship is no longer a time where people complain or gossip, but a time when we share the wonders of his name. And as we do, our memories of his faithfulness grow more vivid. The fear of the Lord will lead us into a deeper and deeper commitment to serve Christ until we are fully consecrated to him. The fear of the Lord will bring delight into our hearts and give us the eternal perspective so joy will fill us no matter what circumstances we face. I, like, I don't know who quoted this, but I found this quote. Don't lose the darkness which you've gained in the light. Don't lose in the darkness which you've gained in the light. Continue to keep in remembrance all the wonderful things God has done and has promised to do. There's times that God has shown us wonderful things, but then there's darkness that comes. We have difficult times. But don't lose in darkness the things that God showed in your light. The things that God did in your life. Keep those memories alive. And so I want to summarize the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord can be summarized up in three words. God is real. God is real. God is real. That is it. God is so real. It's so wonderful. He is so wonderful. So we're going to, where's Dave and his team? We're going to turn, we're going to pray and then Dave's going to come and, and lead us in some worship. And those who want prayer, we're going to ask the prayer teams to come forward. We're going to leave the front area open for those people who want to just pray on their own. But otherwise you can come and you can pray. And, and we're going to have them come to, the, to this aisle here. And then Liz will organize. But let's just turn to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so thankful, Father, for your great love for us, Lord. Oh, God, your ways are so perfect, Father. Your plans are so perfect, Father. Oh, God, thank you for salvation, Lord. Thank you that you're so awesome. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who died for every man, woman, and child, every person who ever lived and ever will live, Father, that those who turn and receive him will be saved. 
And thank you, Lord, that you revealed Jesus to us. That by your Holy Spirit, we came to repentance. That we put our faith in you, Lord. It's so wonderful. It's so wonderful, Father. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for your great love. Thank you, Jesus. And I just want to just give an invitation. If there are people who, here who have never received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, have never come to a saving faith in Jesus, maybe you believe in God, or maybe you've, you've been religious, or maybe whatever, or maybe your lives are really messed up, and you think, how could God ever forgive me? But Jesus died that we could be saved. No matter how messed our lives are, no matter what we've done, and if we just come, and we just have, all we have to do is acknowledge our sins, to confess that we believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, died for our sins, and He rose from the dead in His right hand to the Father, and just to come and say, forgive me, cleanse me, I want to be your child, I want to serve you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.